and welcome to The Other Marthas, the show where a drama student and a film graduate try to make sense of things we wish we were qualified in instead. A quick disclaimer before we get started, we don't claim to be experts on any of the topics we'll be discussing, so while everything we say will be based on individual research, it's all a bit of fun and we suggest that you take everything we say with a pinch of salt. I'm Martha, I'm the drama student. And I'm The Other Martha, the film graduate. (laughs) So Martha, what are you telling me about today? Well Martha, today is a very special episode of The Other Marthas. Um, in that we're returning after a hiatus of some time that was just because of wi-fi issues pretty much so um hello we're back now today i'm going to be telling you about julie daubigny i have my sister to thank for this and i actually had my sister to thank for the uh operation mincemeat episode as well so shout out to natasha thank you for the suggestion um my sister is a history graduate so she actually has much more interesting stories than me so sometimes She just tells me who I should look up and I do it. So now you know. Right. So today, this is the story of Julie Daubigny, whose life, uh, you'll like this, Martha. It really reminds me of some of the best parts of The Monk, which we read back in, I know, which we read back in sixth form, which is just this piece of literature about a monk who gets a bit horny. Someone elopes with a ghost by mistake. And this reminds me of it. So you should like this. Does she elope with a ghost? She doesn't elope with a ghost, but there are certain hijinks involving trying to get people out of convents and killing people and needing to get royal pardons and things like that. So lots of escapades. She's also become something of a bisexual icon. You'll see why presently. In her life, she managed to survive two death sentences. I've realised I've put survive. I kind of mean evade. Survive is slightly misleading. Like, oh yeah, they chopped her head off and she just... She was fine. Or they, they were just really bad at <laughs> yeah. murder. They were just... Or like, I guess, execution. They were just like, oh, ooh, oopsie. But yeah, so she managed to survive a, an awful lot of stuff. But ultimately, she died of what I have diagnosed as gay pining at 33. So this is Julie W. So... She's born around 1673 in Paris, France. She's the only child of Count d'Armagnac, who is a secretary to uh, the master of the horse of Louis XIV. Now, in 1682, so when she is nine, I guess, she moves uh, to Louis XIV's palace at Versailles. um, And she lives there in the Grand Stables. And she's educated alongside the court pages. You, yes she lives it's in a not stable. a stables it's the stables so just considering her dad worked for the master of horse i assume it's just kind of it's like it'd be like living in the financial district you don't actually live in the bank but you live where the bankers do their stuff you know so she lives in the stables right yeah okay um i could be wrong maybe she slept just in some hay but i don't think so so wait her dad was master of the horse no her dad was a secretary to the master of the horse Count oh, I was gonna say. well i've got my notebook to make notes but i'm having to stroke my dog's face so um so she's living in uh, the grand stables at this point she's educated alongside the court pages um because her dad just kind of thinks why not good man uh she's learning riding drawing dancing and swordsmanship and she's very good Glorious. at them, especially swordsmanship she is a badass what a um, fun education. I know. Uh, now, when she's 14, uh, the Comte, who's just a local noble, I guess, took her as a mistress, which uh, happened at the time. And as was commonly the case, he took her as a mistress, but married her off to a guy named Maupin to kind of keep up appearances and then sent Maupin to go and live um, in the South in this cushy what job. What a snake! I know, I know. Very clever. Um now, the idea was that Julie would go with her husband, but she just kind of went, nah, and stayed in Versailles. Gets bored with the Comte and her distant husband, so she eloped with her fencing master, who's a guy called Sir Anne. So she and her fencing master are getting along fine until he kills someone in an illegal duel, so they have to kind of go on the run for a bit, and they make a living... Um, doing fencing demonstrations and as kind of travelling entertainers in taverns and fairs and stuff like that. But after a while, she gets a little bit bored. And so she gets a girlfriend. Um, She is uh, swashbuckling around with uh, her fencing master, 
she spots a local merchant's daughter and she goes, oh, hey. and um, they spark up a romance. And as you may imagine, in 17th century France, this wasn't like super chill. Um, it happened, but people were a little like, what? That's not, that's not how it works. And so the girl's parents sent her to a convent to kind of de-lesbian herself. Um, and I put, Classic. I know about this. Well, I don't get why when homophobic parents think that their kids are gay in order to stop them from being gay they send them where all the other gays go and all the other girls her age yeah exactly Sounds exactly like, like it really discourage like, her yeah you'd be like oh okay i'm gonna send you to you know a boys boarding school she'd be like but i'm a girl and they'd be like ha like that that wouldn't be well, a good thing to do but from that it- with what they're trying to do yeah or like again we don't condone that but like say like okay you're you have to stay here then and yeah or um, what some people did do like marry marry their kids off um and go okay it's fine she can't she can't gay anymore because she's with man um which also obviously not a good thing to do but it just doesn't make any sense to me what their thinking is like oh no can't have well, them gaying, I think better go where the gaying is. I think it's because they think it's devilry, don't they? That's and true, so that's true. They don't think like, oh, if she's around other girls, like it's not really going to discourage her. They probably think like, oh, if she's around the nuns, the nuns will get the devil out of her. True. And to so be it's... fair, I mean, I doubt, I doubt it would have been fun. But yeah, it's just something I find... I just thought, wouldn't it be Mm. so cute if, like, the head nun or whatever they're called is also gay Mm. and she's like, yeah, she's like, send your horrible sinning daughters (laughs) here. And then she sends them there and she's like, it's okay. That's it. That (laughs) would be really awesome. A lovely time at the convent. I think that'd be cute. I don't think think that would be fantastic. It would be cute. So what Julie does, she's like, oh no, my girlfriend's in a convent. What am I going to do? It's only one thing to do. She uh, enters the convent herself. So she takes the holy orders um, and is like, yeah, no, I renounce, I don't know, the devil and whatever else you may have to renounce and I'm going to not kill. And is admitted to the nunnery. (laughs) She waits for a nun to die. And then she snatches the body, smuggles it into her girlfriend's room and like tucks it under the covers. You know, like... um, I know it's really morbid, but you know, like you hear about in boarding school stories when people yeah, are like, just use "Oh, a pillow." Yeah, I know. Didn't necessarily need to be a body, but um... not a nun's actual core. <laughs> well, well, Ugh. I can see why she wouldn't use a pillow because what she then does is set fire to the whole convent. So I guess she just wants people to find bones in her girlfriend's room and be like, "Oh my god, she's dead." So <laughs> she and the girlfriend merrily ride into the distance Um, the girlfriend is presumed dead so the two of them can just kind of gallivant away however three months into this gallivanting the girlfriend is like look julie i kind of quite liked being alive and having a family and like not you know sleeping under a horse with you pretending to fence but it's quite embarrassing so she goes back to her parents which which has got to be a bit of a blow um yeah that's gotta hurt when you've snuck someone out of a nunnery by burning it down uh, yeah it's gonna be i mean to be fair it's awkward for the girlfriend as well because she's like i appreciate what you did but (laughs) But i didn't ask you to do it Um, and also it was very extra like (laughs) julie is nothing she might have written letters like she might have been like hey julie not loving it here. Can you find a way of getting me out? Yeah, and, and then Julie like, like sneaks in <laughs> with a corpse and he's like, I'm going to set the nunnery alight. And then the girl's like, okay. Um, yeah, to be fair, it would put you off, wouldn't it? It would put me off because I would just think like, I appreciate the planning, fine. Mm. But there's sort of a level where if you're going out with someone and all of a sudden they propose something that is, you know, not normal... Yeah. To be like, uh, can't they say no because you're holding a corpse and also <laughs> matches? So The girlfriend's parents this time uh, are not taking chances. 
considering from their point of view they're just you know a nice little merchant family and then all of a sudden their daughter has a girlfriend so they're like oh god she's gonna go to hell let's send her to a convent and then the convent burns down they're like oh my god we've killed our only daughter by sending her to this convent she died horribly in a fire and then the daughter rocks up like yeah no um i just didn't like you so uh you know faked my own death but it wasn't me it was julie so they they don't like julie and so they take it to court um and they basically get julie convicted of arson and body snatching and kidnapping all of which is entirely fair she did do all of these things and uh, so she's sentenced to burn at the stake. Harsh. Yeah. Uh, it, well, I mean, you say harsh. She did burn down a convent and manhandle a nun's body to fake someone else's death and kidnap that person. But I'm putting on my defence lawyer hat. All right. Number one. We don't know if anyone was hurt in the fire. No. If someone was killed in the fire maybe that is you know for the time it's like okay well you killed some nuns so (laughs) you have to burn yeah but we don't know that secondly yes she manhandled a nun's corpse but the (laughs) nun was dead and as far as we know she just carried it from one place to a cozy bed and then set fire to it for the charge of kidnap I don't think she kidnapped her girlfriend. I think the girlfriend was like, yeah, sounds good, like escaped. And then like a few months down the line was like, okay, I'm not having any fun now, bye. Burning is too much. Possibly a little extreme, but bear in mind also that at this time, because she was, she loved dueling and getting into sword fights, she'd killed a good sort of estimated about 10 men just in duels at this point. She'd always managed to get away with it. Well, that's their own stupid fault for (laughs) dueling her. I know dueling is such a, it's just such a weird culture and it's all like, I, I'll get into this a little bit later, but um, it's always things where, you know, you've been seeing a girl for two weeks and then someone else, you know, I don't know, her brother doesn't approve. So you fight to the death. Like, no, have a little yeah. conversation. It's Why? very dramatic. It's just not something to die over if you're like, oh, I'm not sure about this lad you've been seeing. But like, okay, well, thanks for your opinion. I'll I'll bear it in mind. It is very dramatic, especially with a sword fight. Mm. I think also that's different than a duel with guns. Yes, I agree. With the sword fight, like some of it is based on like skill and you know mm. fighting. Whereas like with a gun duel, you literally it's like who turn around the fastest. <laughs> yeah, and who's like quickest with the gun. Yeah, and that's it. Also, I think with um. I mean, it really depends on what your aim is, but with things like sword duels, in the same way as I guess some people resolve things with just fisticuffs, there can be a clear point at which someone's won without it being that the other person has died. Like it yeah, like how in the films, or... they like how in the films they like knock the sword away and put put it to their neck, and they're like Do surrender. surrender. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Whereas yeah. um, with a gun, it's kind of just too late as soon as literally anything's happened. But this lady, just with a sword, has managed to do quite a lot of damage. Mm. Um, do you know, though, that's the only thing that I learned from Hamilton, was mm. that if I met her in a gun duel, just to full-on shoot them. I feel I'd that be is burnt. not um, the message Hamilton is trying to convey. <laughs> <laughs> because it doesn't go well for either Hamilton to be like, oh, I'm going to shoot at the sky. Like, it's oh, what you? Now you're dead. Whereas... Burr and the other guy having a lovely time. I mean, I don't. I feel like they may have been tortured for the rest of their lives about it, but um, I don't think. I don't think Theatre McGee was Theatre McGee. Oh, uh, George Eker. <laughs> Theatre McGee. I guess we'd have to write a musical called George Eker. Eker. I don't think it would sell well. And he's pointing instead of his, his finger pointing upwards, he's just pointing a gun straight yeah. forwards. <laughs> But anyway, she's uh, she's in a sticky situation with everything she's been convicted of. There's only one problem um, from the sort of prosecution's viewpoint here, which is that Julie doesn't bother coming to court. Julie is busy in Paris. She's seducing a singer called Gabrielle Vincent Thevenard, who um, 
is helping her to get an audition for the Paris Opera. <laughs> She's like, sorry, everyone, can't stand trial because I've um, got a I'm really important audition. Singer. What a big break. Um, I love that. Isn't it amazing? And the opera and the Comte de Moniac uh, are so taken by her voice that they petition the king to lift her sentence. And he basically is just so, he thinks that's so hilarious that he does it. He's just like, yeah, join the opera. Why not? Is this um, still Louis XIV? Yeah. Classic. Uh, he, yeah, it's a very Louis XIV kind of thing to do. In I my need sort to of... polish up my chords, I think, then. Your chords? Oh, my vocal cords. You know, <laughs> just in case I want to get away with anything. Yeah, true. Just if you need a queen's pardon. But yes, so, uh, so instead of being burnt to death, Julie joins the opera, where she enjoys a hugely successful career as uh, La Moupin, which is the name, uh, Moupin being the name of the husband that uh, she was married off to when she was 14, who she's seen about once. Um, she's just like, oh, that's quite a fun stage name. So she takes it. I bet he liked that. Yeah, I bet. Well, he probably had no idea. Like, he's just having his job down south. Like, oh, I had a wife once. Yeah, he's like, oh, I had a wife at one point. And then they hear about, he hears about this, like, scandalous yeah. opera singer. And he's like, is that my wife? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, fans really liked her. She apparently had the most gorgeous voice. Um, and they also really liked her androgynous aesthetic, which I think is really cool because that then became such an emblem of, like, rock and metal like with Marilyn Manson and Ziggy Stardust you know centuries later Sorry. and she had it down already you said yes? Manson and it threw me thought you were talking about the Manson family that's okay although I think I'm right in saying that Marilyn Manson chose his name from Marilyn Monroe and Charlie Manson which is really disturbing I mean you know it's the kind of thing people do is it people do uh, just... people name themselves after murderers people and are weird leaders. Um, so, Julie conducted various affairs during her time at the opera uh, with people of all genders. And one time she publicly beat up a man for pestering her female co-stars. She's really cool and entirely shameless. And she was able to get away with all this, um, largely because French court at the time was just super queer, very drag heavy and funky court was quite a flamboyant place and in particular louis the 14th's brother i believe this was philippe it might have been a different one was just quite openly gay and he enjoyed such pastimes as dressing in drag and sleeping with men so louis kind of had to turn a blind eye <laughs> sorry i love that those... good thing you're like he's quite openly gay he likes drag and sleeping with men it's like okay well yeah that <laughs> we didn't really need the like, drag part but yeah i mean we didn't need the drag part to be the hobby to prove someone was gay i think the, if they're the also sleeping part. with men but yeah basically they couldn't crack down too hard on it even though the church and sort of the official stance was very homophobic because um otherwise they would kind of have to crack down on the royal family as well and they didn't want that and so julie could pretty much do what she wanted until this one time in 1695 when she took things a smidge too far. So <laughs> Louis' brother Philippe invites Julie to a ball. All fine and dandy, lovely royal ball, what could go wrong? So Julie turns up in man's clothing, which isn't unusual for her. There's, you know, also, people muttering. Go on. Men's clothing at the time is also like Flamboyant. quite got kind of a feminine side to it. Yeah, like, it's definitely more dressy than nowadays. Yeah, it looks like sure. a dress. It yeah. just has trousers instead of a skirt. Yeah, but um, men. either way, she she turns up in men's garb and she proceeds to dance with all of the ladies. She's basically playing the man, I guess. How Obviously, fun. that's problematic nowadays, but I think that's what she was going for. And uh, that's fine. There's like a few people behind their fans being like, isn't that a woman? She shouldn't be dancing with the women. But everyone's just kind of like, oh, it's Julie, it's fine. Until uh, Julie decides to have a bit of a snog with an eligible Marquise whom several of the men at the ball were courting, which really makes me laugh, partly because they got up this Marquise who's invited, like, I don't know, five different suitors to the ball as it is and been like, mm, maybe one of you has a chance. I don't know, woo me. And then this lady turns up in drag and she's like, actually... Um, and just has a nice little snog. Um, and then what happens immediately is three of these suitors are like, okay, Julie, you and me outside, this has gone far enough. 
And so the Marquise is just like, oh no, have I done something wrong? Oh, ah oh, me, I was just having fun with my female friend. But um, Julie's like, yeah, sure thing. And follows these three men outside, proceeds to defeat them very calmly one by one. So they're just kind of coming at her with swords and she's like, oh, blip, blip, stab, who's next? Wipes off her sword and goes back inside to be like, where were we? And everyone's like, you just killed three men. And Julie's like, yeah, I, I, oh, I'm so wild. But this is a little bit too far even for Julie. And she decides to wait for it all to blow over and pop over to Brussels for a bit. So she does that. She has an affair with a German prince while she's over there. Just you, the change of scene. She's there for a year and then she's like, that's enough. Like, no one will remember the three men I killed. So then she she comes back to Paris. She actually reunites briefly with her husband, who, again, I'm pretty sure she's not seen since she was 14. She's like, hey, remember me? I've been using your name at the opera, Wild Times. Um, and she goes back to the opera full time. She has a, a, a fantastic time there, even more successful run. Um, and she, at the same time, becomes known for winning fist fights. Just a few other things she did while she was having a fun time at the opera. She threatened to shoot the Duchess of Luxembourg. I don't know the context of that, but she just she just threatened That's it. That's amazing. I Isn't love it? that. Um, she ended up in court for attacking her landlord. At one point, she Relatable. decided that she wanted to be a maid uh, for this very popular noblewoman called the Countess Marino. And when she was supposed to be getting this lady ready for this uh, really big ball, she adorned the back of her hair with radishes just for the lols. <laughs> like, oh, yes, there you are. Your bows are all in place. And she just whacked radishes on the back of her head. Um, How did this woman not notice radishes? I don't know. I don't know. Well, maybe I, I'm, I'm thinking about the time. I assume she maybe had like a tall wig or something. But yes, she also uh, reportedly, one of her affairs was with this guy called the Elector of Bavaria. Well, it wasn't his name, that was who he was. And uh, she was in a bit of a fling with him. And then he realised that she was a little too intense when she stabbed herself on stage with a real dagger. Oh and so God. he... Like, I know. He uh, he like comes up after the show and he's like, hey, Julie... Um, I've been thinking you're a little intense. You literally stabbed yourself on stage. So he offers her 40,000 francs and is like, please leave me alone. Just don't see me again. <laughs> wow. Imagine um, like being so extra that your like <laughs> boyfriend pays you off to not see you anymore. I know. I mean, that's essentially what happened with um, Anne of Cleves and Henry VIII, I guess. But that was not her being extra. That was just him being like... Rude. Yeah. <laughs> So alas, Judy's final chapter was soon oh, to no. come. Uh, she fell in love with the Marquise de Florence and this Marquise died in 1705, at which point Judy was so distraught that she retired from the opera and she joined a convent, funnily enough. And that's where she died what? two years later, age 33. Um, I don't know what of. Maybe the convent took its revenge and ate her, I don't know. That's so weird. I know. And she was like, oh, I, yeah, I burnt down a convent once. And they're like, welcome. <laughs> but she seemed to just be very good at running from her past. So I don't know if she just kind of didn't really have to say who she was or... Yeah, I guess not. I suppose if a convent, like convent, if a woman turns up a bit destitute looking and it's like, I love Jesus. It's kind of the one thing they're supposed to do is take him in, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. That's kind exactly. of their whole job. I mean, also, other than I suppose, just being rude. Yeah, and a lot of the point of convents is, oh, this woman is sinful, please take her in. So mm -hmm. I guess if they're like, oh, too much sin for us, it's like, oh my God, where do we put her? Yeah, that's true. I suppose they can't really turn someone away, especially. But I wouldn't want to be the convent that knows no. she's burnt down a convent. And you're like, I feel like you'd have to put a watch on her to be like, <laughs> yeah. make sure she doesn't burn us all in our I'm beds. just imagining like one of the nuns has a cough and they're all like the moment one of the nuns dies Julie is out of there oh yeah true <laughs> but yeah so she she died quietly in a convent at 33 and that's about it which is so weird uh, and it always it um makes me wonder as well because other than this last love affair with the Marquise de Florence she seems to have sort of moved from person to person really quickly and she's always like absolutely obsessively in love with them but then 
as soon as it sort of fizzles out or becomes less than her fantasy, then she'll just move on to the next one and that's fine. So why it was that she was so attached to this one woman that when she died, she was just like, right, that's it for me. I don't know. Well, people, I, I suppose though that there are people like modern people that have done that that have had like yeah. you know like people do have like a loads of partners and then they're just like oh then this is oh, this here's one. one person that's true maybe they... like the entirety of julie's life up until she meets the marquis de florence is essentially her hoe phase and then she's like ready to settle down with this marquis yeah. yeah that's true actually and i don't know the nature of her relationship with the marquis de florence like whether they were sort of fully together or whether it was a case of they knew each other and there was some romantic activity going on but it wasn't an established relationship or whether it was just Julie pining after her I don't know so wait you said that she that she was going to be killed twice so the first one was burned to a stake yeah what, that's the second actually, one killing the three men at the party yes I think so um, right. but that's a good question because I kept reading that she had to be officially pardoned twice and the second the the famous one is the the convent situation but yeah i think the second one is when she then had to kind of go to brussels wait for it to blow over and then come back so um is the the person that paid her off yeah and said leave me alone was that a man yeah oh okay sorry i was confused i think because they both had f in their name i think i was confusing the person that paid her off and the person she loved forever and i was like ah no no the elector of bavaria is the the guy who paid her off and um they they were just a fling i think oh and he sorry, was probably yeah. very excited that this very passionate intense incredible woman was interested in him and then she stabbed herself on stage and he was like oh i will take my nice bread and water wife any day but thank this you this is the thing you knew what she was like when well, you start going out with her, so well, then yeah, but like, sometimes sometimes Whoa. people just get in too deep, and then they're like, oh, I, I didn't so. mean it to get this in dance. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, just <laughs> poor lad getting a bit carried away. Okay, and then so the mar the Marquise de Florence. Mm-hmm. We don't know whether they were going out for sure. Um, I don't know. I'm sure someone does, but I didn't look it up that far. I suspect it will have been a case of something like the middle option that I suggested in terms of they weren't allowed to be a super established relationship, but sure. they will have had amorous connections. And clearly Julie was very besotted with her. Yeah. She's cool. Right? I know. And um, there's a certain amount of speculation as to sort of how much of it to believe. We don't know her exact birth date or place, and her name seems to change within sort of documents and letters and things. So her stage name was always Mademoiselle Maupin. And she's also referred to in letters as Madeleine, Emily and Julia, as well as Madame de Maupin. So it may be that elements of her story have been embellished or merged with other people's escapades. But um, I'm inclined to just kind of take it as read and be like, absolute legend. Yeah, I suppose like nowadays, like if she was alive nowadays, she'd probably have a re- like a reality TV show. Yeah, she probably would. To be fair, it's all these all these historical people where because them existing openly at a time that was so resistant to people who defied gender norms so outrageously and also were so openly queer, it's really, really cool because it's like, how did you manage to just have such a brazen, fantastic life when all of this was so illicit in your time? But nowadays it would just kind of be like oh, what's julie done now like can she calm down i don't like, know though popping I up on facebook think... like oh julie's engaged again is she mm. <laughs> i don't know i do think that there'd definitely be an audience for it oh yeah i think the only thing that would put people like modern people off of her and i mean you know people that are all good with the the whole gay situation. good with the gay good with the gays is um the murder yeah because i think that would be her downfall nowadays would be the fact that she was murdering people that's Aside true from that but again it was entirely honorable to do it in well i say that not legally but from a personal viewpoint people would see it as a point of honor to duel over disagreements um, yeah i just find it weird that the men were so willing to duel with a woman 
because yeah. even that like I feel like my assumption would be that they'd be like oh how embarrassing yeah like, I wouldn't even try and fight with you because yeah I'll just win. I actually that's a really good point I'm glad you said that because I uh when I read that was sort of almost in a way chuffed that they saw it as a threat because I think a lot of the time in periods of history before they necessarily had a language for what being queer was particularly between women it'd be like you could watch your wife and another woman having a snog and be like ah oh, I wish I could understand these close bosom friendships that these yeah. women have and you just because it would be like that could never threaten the love that I a man give a woman and you just don't understand it as the same thing whereas these guys are like oh my god this woman of... might steal my woman yeah they kind of treated it like how you would treat it if at a party a man started snogging the girl you were courting. Exactly, exactly. And it probably helped, well, not helped, but contributed that she was dressed as a man. So I feel like it would be easier for them to be like, this man impersonator is stealing my woman. <laughs> but I went, did everyone know it was her? Or was it like a masked ball? So she like <laughs> comes in as a man and then like only after she's murdered them all, she like takes her mask on and she's like, hey, it's me, I am it's Julie. No and everyone was like, whoa. Yeah, everyone's like, oh my God, Julie. <laughs> Why have you done? Why have you done this? And also, why have you taken your mask off when yeah, you exactly. didn't know who you were after you've murdered three people? Now would be the, the time on. to keep the mask on and like run. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm pretty sure they all knew it was her. It was just kind of a thing that she did. She enjoyed cross dressing and and making a bit of an impression and transgressing gender norms. Um, I think she's so fun. I'd love a TV show about her. Or yeah, I was going to say it sounds slightly like Gentleman Jack. Yeah, I never watched that. Neither did I. So I don't really know what I'm basing that off other than just the central character exploring more masculine and inverted commas presentations, but still being like, yeah, I'm a woman and I'm Mm. also gay. Yeah, I don't know. But I think I feel like this one would have more fun escapades again, having never seen it. But I just feel like there'd be fun escapades in it because it's like, oh, murder. Yay. Oh, I'm not pressing it now. Yeah, 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 that's true. I feel like. And also more fun colours because. Yes. I don't, I'm not sure what, is it Victorian, Gentleman Jack? Ooh, I want to say yes. I've seen a lot of people wearing black in it. Yeah, it's very drab. Whereas Louis XIV's court, glorious colours. Yeah. And so it would be fun just visually. (laughs) That's very true. I feel like it could be done either as like a swashbuckling romp, like the Three Mm. Musketeers almost, or it would be one of those like artsy French films where you end up walking out of the cinema. (laughs) That's not where I was going with it. If you wanted to portray her life as like this empty thing of always following the next thrill like um like amadeus or uh requiem for a dream in a way i'd do it swashbucking swashbucking <laughs> swashbuckling i think that's more fun like yeah. yes obviously we can have a sad portrait of a woman but isn't it more fun to be like hey set fire to the nuns yeah hey, yeah true stab and the also men. there's something to be said about it being portrayed as cool and empowering that she just kind of lets her emotions rule her and makes the best of it and moves on as opposed to it being this kind of desperate search for something yeah, I just think, like, sure, maybe that's what she was doing. But also, could she not have just been having fun? Yeah, 100%. I think <laughs> my my psychological portrait of the possible her is more just, like, what I'm projecting onto it than... Yeah, than... I feel like she could be, like, like a Jack Sparrow kind of figure. But, yeah. like, more fun because she's actually not just a weird drunk pirate guy yeah, i don't true. i don't remember any of the plots of pirates of the caribbean as a side note i just remember kind of like a vibe <laughs> yeah yeah and like I, I don't yeah i couldn't tell you what's happened in any of them but i've got a very strong visual mood board of the film but what i'm saying is there would be a strong vibe yes and i think we should pitch it i think we should go around and pitch our tv show to be fair yeah i think it'll be be fun i think someone's gonna listen to this and gonna steal our idea and then we'll sue them for millions and we won't have to do any work 
Oh, yes, please. That's such but a good But we don't idea. own the story, so everyone would be like, you don't have any money. That's you true. You can't have our money because you don't own the story. And we'd be like, okay, well, So basically, enough. if our next podcast is us sulking and trying to say why this was our idea, it's because someone else had an idea and we're salty about it. Well, no, I've thoroughly enjoyed learning about her. Good, I did as well. Yeah, I think I think she's just she's slightly divisive because of all the murder. Yeah. But also, she didn't really much. She just killed people in duels that people like stupid for either involved, challenged but... her to or accepted the challenge of. Because when someone offers to duel you, you can be like, "Oh no, thank you." Yeah. I'll take the shame. We can blame the dueling culture rather than ju- yeah. the duely. I wonder when dueling became a not popular. Oh, um, you know, I'm not sure. My first thought was like after the First World War because everyone had had enough of shooting people. Oh, that's not a bad shout, actually. Because I can imagine like up until the late 1800s, people being like, yeah, I'll have a, I'll have a pop. Whereas <laughs> like, I can't imagine after like 1918, like, because I could imagine during the war, mm. start, if you give a whole bunch of young men pistols and guns, they're going to be like, let's have oh. a duel. Yeah. But like later on, uh, I couldn't imagine. But maybe we don't know. No, I'll look that's it up a really good point. Know. Yeah, I'd be really interested to know that. Okay, apparently England's last duel was on the twentieth of May, eighteen forty-five, and by that point, people were kind of mocking it. Okay, people were kind of like, "Oh, this is kind of stupid." Many dying over someone buying the shoes they wanted. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's interesting. So we were wrong. So it was it was later, but do you know? I'm happy it was later because people were being slightly less stupid. Thank you for listening to the Other Martha's podcast, the show where a drama student and a film graduate talk about things we have no business knowing. If you enjoyed today's episode, please do like the video, subscribe to our channel, and listen to the next one. Bye. Bye.